Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Auslander. Welcome to the MSU Museum and our event, uh, Music and Healing, Finding Her Voice. Uh, it's just a joy to see you all here tonight. Again, I'm Mark Auslander, the director of the MSU Museum. We are doing this event in partnership with uh, the organization Survivor Strong. And here uh, to learn a little bit about, to tell us a little bit about Survivor Strong and to start off the evening is uh, the Director of Advocacy for Survivor Strong, Sister Survivor Amanda Smith. Hi. I'm Amanda Smith. I'm the Victim Advocate and the Advocacy Director at Survivor Strong, which is a nonprofit that was started by two fellow sister survivors. And we are very new, but we are trying our hardest to change one thing at a time. And we have worked with the museum quite a bit, and we have found that there has been so much advocacy and healing through art and music and therapy that we couldn't ask for a better co-sponsor for this event. So I would like to start off this little thing, it's an Indian singing bowl. And it's just a form of meditation and something that has helped many different people. If it's not for you, don't worry, it's not for everybody. And it gets a little loud, so I'm going to try to back away from it. With this exhibit, I helped co-curate that, honestly, art and healing are a huge, huge help for me. Again, it's not for everybody, but it is for some people. And those people might not know how it could have helped them in the first place. So I'm so very thankful to the MSU Museum for helping me find that for my healing and helping me be able to advocate for others. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. So, um, so the event tonight is organized with uh, our friends in the College of Music, uh, and especially uh, two classes uh, uh, by, by uh, our colleague, uh, Marcy, Marcy Ray. Um, you will uh, here, students from uh, Music ni uh, 992, which is Music and Violence, and also Dr. Ray's course, Music, Gender, and Sexuality, uh, Music 424. We'll also hear a little bit later from Dr. Isaac uh, Kalumbu, a, a, a Grammy-nominated uh, uh, performer in some of his new work. Uh, we'll also hear, we're very lucky to hear from the Women's Chamber Ensemble. And we're going to begin with really the person who sort of brings us all together on this theme of music and healing, Carmier, one of the sister survivors, uh, whose story has moved all of us profoundly on this campus throughout the exhibition process. And here to introduce uh, Amanda is, uh, is one of her former faculty members, uh, Sandra Snow. So Amanda was Amanda Esch. Um, she's now Amanda Cormier, um, a resident of Nashville, from where she came, I believe, originally. Um, an educator for the Country Music Hall of Spain, and I know she does great work in that context. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Um, I met her when she joined the MSU Women's Chamber Ensemble, uh, a choir that quickly took on extra musical identity as a safe space for women to be vulnerable together, to support one another, and to make meaning through the artistic process. Amanda's a beautiful singer, and she brought so much both in and out of the ensemble in the College of Music. I have very vivid memories of her eyes, both in rehearsal and performance, like 
the kind of eyes that teachers look for. You're always looking for that student who you can make a connection with that says affirming things like, yeah, we're, we're doing this. Amanda's was always the eyes in the room, um, so full of int intensity and focus and connection. Her musicianship included a passion for writing her own material, and we're going to hear one of those songs today. And in the wake of the experience that Amanda had, she's become an advocate for victims and survivors, working um, in the state of Tennessee, I think currently on the issue of elimination of the statute of limitations for felony child sex abuse. It is a joy to see Amanda. I understand you have a baby, Hazel. Yeah. And uh, we welcome you here to campus, Amanda. We're really glad to have, have you here. Thank you. 
you care to introduce the next the next performance? Yeah, the, and, and then we can bring out the uh, the Lewis Chamber Ensemble. Hi, good evening. I'm Marcy Ray. I'm a musicologist here at MSU in the College of Music. And we've had the privilege of collaborating in a small way with this exhibit. Two of my courses had units um, or courses, um, um, lectures on gender-based violence. And following those discussions, we came to this exhibit. And this exhibit inspired several of my students to want to contribute to this event because the kinds of things that we talked about were the ways in which music discourse can silence or dodge, or music itself can dodge um, the violence inherent in some music, making it ironic or trivializing it or making it beautiful. Um, and so these students here um, want to support healing um, by kind of rejecting the flow of this kind of cultural conditioning. And so tonight we have uh, the Women's Chamber Ensemble, and they're going to be performing two pieces, um, which you can see on your program, and uh, they are fantastic. And I know that they were, um, as Dr. Snow said, were a safe space, um, not only for several survivors, um, but also for all the women who participated in the past. So please welcome them, uh, Women's Chamber Ensemble.
survivors uh, in the development of this exhibition have, and, and so much other advocacy work, have insisted that their struggle is not limited to this one series of horrific crimes that took place centered on this campus, in which, as we know, our university leadership, along the leadership of many organizations, was profoundly complicit. And we must never forget that, that, uh, uh, that the sister survivors uh, saw their deep, uh, their, their tr the trust in which they had placed in this institution, in the medical profession, uh, and in gymnastics and athletics and so forth, was again and again betrayed most obviously by this institution. At the same time, they've also insisted that the struggle against gender-based violence, against sexual violence, is a global one, is international in its, con in, in, in its scope. And so at this point, I'd like very much in that, in that spirit of, that, uh, of international solidarity uh, to introduce my uh, wonderful colleague, Isaac Kalubu. If you could come up here, Isaac. So Isaac uh, plays many important roles on campus, uh, as well as internationally. Uh, he is currently uh, our new uh, director of uh, education at, at, uh, at the African Studies Center, International Studies. Uh, but he is also known internationally uh, for his work both as a performer um, and, as a, and as a songwriter. And he's going to share two works uh, which are recorded, and if we can get all the technology to work. Uh, again, on pages three and four of your program, you, you, the first is in the Zimbabwean language of, uh, of Shona, uh, with a translation, and then the second one is in English. And, uh, and Isaac, I, do you want to say a little bit about the, about the work? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oslander, for having me here, and thanks uh, to everyone who's here. Uh, it's a tough act to follow these wonderful performers who performed before before me, but um, uh, what I have here are two pieces. Um, as Dr. Oslander said, there's, the first one is sung in Shona, and it's really talking about a very common problem, uh, at least in my culture, I'm, I'm sure it's global, uh, where daughters-in-law get caught between their husband and the mother-in-law and probably other members of the family. And um, uh, I wrote this song out of my observations, just seeing what women go through uh, in marriages and how families can be very cruel to the incoming new relatives, you know, in, in, uh, daughters-in-law in this case. Um, so the song touches on something that uh, gets a lot of the times uh, looked over, which is emotional violence. Um, so it's really talking about the way in which this woman is emotionally harassed and violated. Um, and because of that, uh, uh, you know, she's very, very unhappy and, and is depressed and sad and is suffering. And she has no one to talk to about this situation. Um, uh, then it talks about how sometimes the perpetration of emotional violence extends to physical violence, uh, especially when alcohol is involved. Um, so there is, you know, the thin line between, well, let's put it this way, the absence of respect and love can create the problem of the emotional violence, but that can escalate to physical violence. Uh, both of these domains of violence are not right, no matter uh, when or how they're being perpetrated against somebody. So the song really is a reflection of what I grew up seeing among my own people, and it expresses uh, the plight of many women. So we can go to that first piece. <laughs> Yeah. 
primary uh, clientele or, or, or patient population would be diagnosed with clinical depression. Yeah. And many of those uh, cases, they have an abuse mm -hmm. history. And a lot of them have a sexual abuse history. And, and as I was thinking about this topic, um, I did come across a song that, um, that was written. Um, I, I do have a recording. Um, and I would have loved to play this and sang this, but we recently have moved, my wife and I, and uh, it's buried somewhere in a box, and I would have needed to uh, go over it a little bit, but um, I can share the words. And this is a fictitious story, um, but it came out of many stories of, of sexual abuse. Um, the words can be a little intense, just uh, warning you ahead of time. Um, but this would be something I would do within a, in a process group and then we talk about these lyrics and, and experience. Um, so the first verse, um, Mama said she never heard the footsteps coming toward my door. Your daddy sometimes drank too much. He was a good man, paid the bills. Crazy thoughts are in your head. Bad dreams in a world full of make-believe. Just a child, so very young. These things you say, they can't be true. In the chorus, Daddy, why'd you do those things? You said you loved me, that's a lie. You took away my innocence, drank my breath, and left me to die. Verse 2, I lie trembling in my bed, the shadow looming at my door. If I pretend I've fallen asleep, maybe he'll turn and walk away. That's a lie. The smell of whiskey on his breath, the heavy weight I cannot bear. I feel my body turning numb, but in my soul I feel the pain. Chorus. Oh, Daddy, why'd you do those things? You said you loved me, that's a lie. You took away my innocence, drank my breath, left me to die, left me to die. And verse 3. I walked by Mama's room last night. The door was cracked, so I looked in. Tears were running down her face. In her eyes, the truth was known, she said. I was paralyzed by fear. Would he leave? What could I do? My father loved me the same way. Time will bear your childhood memories. Of course, why'd you let him do those things? Why'd you say you loved me? That's why. He took away my innocence, shared his drink, left me to die. Oh, Daddy, why'd you do those things? I still love you, I don't know why. You took away my innocence, left this world and me behind. Left this world and me behind, but I survived. So, I worked uh, in behavioral health about five years. I was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I love my work in the area of health, but um, the, the commute 75 miles one way and driving up 127 in the winter, um, something opened up at, at U of M, so I, I jumped on it, um, where I worked in pediatrics for about 13 plus years. Um, in that setting, I uh, worked in all units, um, but uh, a unit that uh, really um, spoke to me and I treasured was the intensive care unit, and I could work with patients that a lot of other therapists, for obvious reasons, couldn't work with. Patients were intubated on life support, sometimes in medically induced comas, sometimes in natural comas. Um, but the unbelievable thing, and the, the reason I felt that I could come here tonight, is is the title of this music and healing, and I could watch music healing. Um, I could play music for about um, an average of 30 to 45 minutes I'm with these patients. And, and in that time, I could watch heart rate, respiration, blood pressure, um, a few trauma cases, intracranial pressure. I could watch all of these things decrease just through music. Um, I've, there were uh, a few times I uh, specifically remember a nurse saying, you can't leave, this is the best this patient's you know, been going for, for weeks. Um, so music is very powerful. And boy, what a display tonight with, with all the music we heard. Um, it's just lovely. And uh, as I transitioned out of Peds into Adult Cancer Center, um, I still continue to see the healing. Um, I, 
primarily work with infusion pac patients that um, are having their infusion, they're often not feeling well, they're, um, they're scared, there's a lot of anxiety and stress, and you can see how music just decreases these things over time, that it, it's, it's very powerful. There's end of life situations. Um, I had many impedes um, as you develop a therapeutic relationship as a music therapist. Um, you're often asked to be um, there when the life support is removed. Um, it can be uh, very intense um, and it's a privilege and an honor, but there, those are some tough days. Um, and then and the same uh, end of life with adults, we do a, a, a thing that's pretty special, we do heartbeat recordings, and so we'll take a heartbeat um, while the patient is still alive, and, and sometimes they're cognizant of that, sometimes they're already uh, too far gone to, to know what's going on with the family would like a recording um, as a legacy, so we'll take that heartbeat, and uh, if they have a song that was special to them, we'll, we'll try and put music to it the best we can, uh, as well as just a regular recording of the heartbeat. But I, I'm, I'm looking around and seeing so, so much sadness. <laughs> it, it, my, my job is, um, it can be intense, but every day is rewarding. And, um, and I, I love my work. Um, there, are, there are tough days, so. And if we have the time, I'll, I'll play a, a song, and this would be uh, just an example of a, a, a song that I uh, would play for a patient while they're having their infusion that would decrease stress and anxiety. Um, I do an original composition. Um, anyhow, it's an instrumental. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
little bit, uh, one of the things that I think that has fascinated many students who've been so moved by, by the song, and so many people have come to listen to it or to take a photograph of the, the phone number where they can listen to it at home, is that you start out addressing an unsympathetic male voice yeah. out there uh, of the kind that we have heard so much at this institution, saying, why can't you get over it? And this constant claim that the does here from certain men that the most endangered species on the planet is the, you know, the straight white guy or something like that. And, and, and others who understand themselves as the only victim of this crisis. Uh, but then you move somewhere else, uh, it, speaking to yourself. And I wondered if you could, for, or speaking maybe to, to all women, could you tell us a little bit about that transition in the song and how that, that musically that also works in a really interesting way? Uh, yeah, I can't say that it was like all intentional in a way, <laughs> but um, this song was created through a couple different free rights that I would do at work because, yeah, I got paid to songwrite. So it's like, because um, I, Part of my job is to teach songwriting, and so like if I'm telling someone to free write, I would do the same thing. And so um, putting the song together was kind of like a couple different free writes put together, and I was trying to go through like some of the main themes that keep popping up as a survivor, which it's very different for all of us. But um, you know, there's a lot like there's a lot of um, self doubt and chaos and all of it. But I think the thing I always kind of came back to in that line is um, like the responses that a lot of us got when we first came out was exactly why we were silent for so long. It's like, everyone pretends like the guys are the ones who are being hurt in the scenario, but really we're finally just taking our voice back that we have now. So, um, yeah, I can't say it was like totally intentional, but I just felt like it was definitely a major theme and, and wanted, I wanted it to be part of the song. I mean, I think the whole world, uh, I've heard from friends all over the world who as they listen to the victim impact statement, remember that exchange between you and Judge Aquilina about what it was like to lose music and her prayer really from the bench mm -hmm. that music and especially songwriting would come back to you. Yeah. Well, and that's the weird part is like, like I said, I teach songwriting, but I wasn't really doing it for myself anymore. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. Marcy, can I ask just your reflections? We've heard such remarkable work by by your students, by students in the Women's, cha women's Chamber Ensemble, you thought about music and trauma and critique and uh, transformation for so long. But what, what, what thoughts are in your mind right now listening to all this work? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the work that I do in my classes, if, if students have taken my classes, they know that I focus a lot on the violence um, because I feel like sometimes we question why there would need to be a space like this one. Why would we need to have a specially de designated space to highlight and hear and validate, uh, validate survivors' voices? And it's because there's so much violence actually in the music where women are being silenced um, or their resistance is being trivialized. And so that's a lot of the work that we do in my classes is just kind of uncovering that so that we can resist it. Um, and so that we can see kind of culturally sanctioned alibis that we have for gender-based violence, um, issues of consent that we make trivial. Um, and so what I think has been so inspiring for me with the students in my courses is that they want to take their beautiful musical talents and use that as a means to reach out and empower and kind of resist the things that we talk about in my classes. And so it's been wonderful um, to have Ashley, I think, is really responsible for bringing the Women's Chamber, so we have to thank her for that. She, she galvanized an effort in the way that she does. So, um, but, it, but it's the work of all these students who felt inspired by this exhibit and wanted to contribute in some way. And thinking about the, the nature of both the physical violence and structural violence and emotional violence that runs through the music industry, this is true. Obviously, we've been hearing a lot about the opera world and classical music, but in country music right now, although there are a lot of extraordinary voices, is it, it, is it right that currently in the top 40, there's not a single women artist featured in the top 40? I have not looked recently, but... Um on average, my dad and I were actually talking about this to some length last night, but um, yeah, no, probably not. And generally, if you listen to mainstream country radio, you are lucky if you hear a woman one per hour, right. which has been a problem for about the last 10 years, but 
magically has gotten worse in the last two years. I don't know Funny how feedback. that's... Yeah, backlash politics is yeah. something else. And Isaac, uh, reggae uh, has a complicated gendered history. It, it, uh, you're very much part of a movement that's, I think in some ways, trying to go back to the roots of, 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 of reggae, in which principles of gender justice were actually quite central. Yes. And it got somewhat obscured, uh, perhaps by the intersection of reggae and the, the, the recording industry. Yes. Say a little bit about what that struggle looks like to bring gender justice back into the center of, of the musical tradition. Yeah, um, so I just feel as an artist, as, as a male artist, that I have a responsibility to speak to males about, about this topic. The thing is that a lot of the people who hear about this are women. Like, if you look in this room right now, there aren't too many men. They're the ones who should be hearing this. Uh, um, and then, of course, uh, there are other, you know, you know uh, extensions of genders and and, and uh, identities that also want to hear this. Uh, but I'm just speaking you know, in general terms that the, a lot of the domestic violence is perpetrated by men. And most of the times they don't hear about this. Um, so reggae music had these values in the 70s and 80s where women were seen as queens, empresses. And that's the favorite term in, in reggae, Rasta language. You know, the woman you love, that's the, the mother of your children, is your empress. You know, um, but with the new style of reggae called dancehall reggae, I don't know how much all of you know about this, there was this uh, valorization of, of guns and drugs and violence, and a lot of that violence uh, against women or just disrespecting them and talking about them in negative ways. Uh, so uh, yes, I am part of a, of a movement that's trying to bring back the, the what, what's called roots music in terms of the, 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 the basic message of uh, equal rights and respect for one another and respect for women. Uh, but my travail into it is, is, is more specific in the sense that um, I, I, I am not necessarily um, as limited as the reggae was in the 70s and 80s in terms of uh, the gendered space, okay? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm open to a wider gender space, um, uh, at the same time saying to the men who are perpetrating the violence, you know what, this is not right, it is, it, it is wrong and you should hear it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You know, there was an interesting continuity uh, Bob, I was thinking, from, all the way from Amanda's song to, to the piece you, you shared with us, which is the extraordinary capacity of music, perhaps more than any other genre, to dramatize precisely the source of, of suffering and then move us somewhere else. So Amanda does that so miraculously in this song and through the chord progressions we go from um, someone who can't speak or who is very right to speak is being denied uh, and then the voice increasingly is summoned up. So we both sort of, there's a musical, almost tone painting of that which is being denied and then that becomes the wellspring of, of the speech. And I don't know, having recently in my own family gone through a number of uh, loved ones you know, going through chemo and spending so much time watching the drip drip. Yeah, I felt in your piece, there was that drip drip and then it, something happened and it went somewhere else and that became not the, the sort of a sense of, of horror but, but, of, but, but of peace and I'm just wondering how it, it seems to be one of the miracles of music that it can take the very source of our suffering and fear and translate it to something to some other level I just wonder if that's just a, if that's conscious or just something that seems to happen. <laughs> So I just want to be clear. So, so we're talking about uh, the, the lyrics that I read. Uh, not the lyrics. No, I'm, no, I'm thinking of the musical piece that you performed. That well, you do. No, no, not not the lyrics. Uh, okay. But but rather the uh, the piece that you performed that you often perform for individuals undergoing infusion. And that reminded me of of the experience of, of being present of so many times for for loved ones who are undergoing chemo. That that there was a sort of 
I felt there was a drip sound, but then it went somewhere else. And mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking about. The, the dramatization of something that was at first hard to hear and then became beautiful. I'd like to say that was conscious, but it, <laughs> it, it, it just evolved. Um, when I work with patients as a music therapist, uh, and I introduce myself and, and the services, the first thing I'll ask them is, you know, what's their musical preference or style or genre? And, um, you know, we're not jukeboxes, but if, if someone says jazz, I, I like to, you know, pull out uh, a, a jazz tune or, or two or three, and, um, you know, or folk or country um, or rock. Um, but. It's the music that um, we resonate with, and it might be different for all of us in here, um, is what brings us comfort and peace, and, and that's what I try to address when I first meet somebody. Yeah, and but your story of the heartbeat recording, I mean, all of us starting life in, in the womb, and that the first music we know of is uh, some combination of, uh, of our own emergent heartbeat and the heartbeat of, of our mother, and then the thought that the transition out of this life um, can be in some ways mediated or guided by the continuation of a heartbeat mixed with beloved music. It's fantastic, it's just overwhelming. But at this point, we'd love to uh, invite other voices and questions and comments, um, especially from the students who've done such extraordinary work, you know, both intellectual work in, in the courses you've been thinking about and the way you've been engaging in this exhibition, with this exhibition. Um, and also musically. So, if there are comments you care to care to share, or questions that you have for uh, for our panelists and performers, uh, please. Yes. Uh, how's it going? I'm a junior here. I was just curious as to, like, all right. So, for example, like I, I I've been here for a little while, actually should see you, but uh, and and I see this cycle of things. It it, it usually goes like a, a fraternity will commit. Uh, act of sexual assault or violence. And then the Greek houses hang up these sheets or they do some uh, some some anti-sexual assault program and then everybody forgets about them. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because it's like, yo, that's like the clan lynching somebody and then hosting an NAACP rally. It, it, and, then, and then when you bring it up to somebody, you bring it up to a crowd, Everybody, oh, we don't really talk about that. It's like, come on, like this is—is is, is that it? It's like a fourteen-dollar bed sheet gets get you get you off. You are literally the perpetrators. You're a pillar of this, whatever. You know what I mean? So I don't know. That was just something I'm curious as to how that keeps going on. So the most vital questions that people are facing as community members, or Amanda, do you want to share some thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess the thing that, that we are finding in my courses is that um, sexual assault is actually a foundation of our culture. So when I teach these courses, we start with Ovid, and we start with the Metamorphoses, and his stories, these creation myths of how we got the laurel tree, how we got um, Pan's flute, how we got um, a Sicilian fountain are all the result of women fleeing from men, fleeing for gods, to um, help them escape and then they are transformed into the things, the beloved parts of our nature. Um, so that the idea of, of violence against women is in fact ingrained in us and you can see it in all types of work. So I study um, sexual assault in Baroque French cantatas, but the issues of consent there are in fact the same as um, low hanging fruit here, um, but blurred lines, right? That consent is like no, can always mean yes, um, and it, when heard in the right way, and that is pretty much any way. And um, so I think the reason why it continues is because we still haven't addressed, um, you know, that we said no means no, and now it has to be yes means yes, but, you know, we're still working with when does no mean no, and when does it not mean yes, right? Um, but at the same time, we want we as a culture want to address that this is wrong and we do so in these quick ways um, and then go back to the status quo because we know it's wrong and yet we still haven't addressed how culturally foundational it is to harm women, right? And I think that's, that's really where we are so that we need a space like this um, because there isn't one anywhere else, right? And that's really the problem I think we're facing. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I, mean, I kind of want to. But I agree with you, and I, I, um, I think sometimes I have problems, especially like when we're talking, like seeing what happens on social media, where it's like this reactionary thing to show you that I care for thirty seconds, but I'm not willing to do the hard work on any of it. And so I think it, the difference of where you'll hopefully see change, but also just like see people's real intent as whether they're willing to put in like the real work to make this stuff change. You know, I'm an educator, so my first thought is, you know, what can we do to teach the next generation? If, if I can't fix what's happening with the adults in front of me, what can I do for the next? So, you know, you can see a little example right here. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're right. That cycle is there for so many things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will just, you know, say that your analogy to lynching and, and is so, Right on. Um, I, I speak as a scholar of, of, of racial violence in the United States. I mean, because it was lynching uh, which sought to preserve a racial order after the Civil War, after the supposed ending of slavery, um, was specifically targeted at sites of black and African American economic and political strength, right? Uh, and really was part of this long <coughs> struggle to destroy Reconstruction. Um, to destroy, destroy the possibility of African American uh, economic and political autonomy, so it was a it was, an it was a form of internal racial terror um, that still continues to this day and is not fully recognized. And so you get these very these overly easy tries for forgiveness, um, claims for forgiveness, we're going to have reconciliation, and it's all over. And I think there is an analogy to what we see right on this campus. And I speak as you know as a recovering white guy who has the all the time, you know, my staff and my my partner and lots of other people are forcing me uh, to hold up a, a tough mirror and say, you know, what what where are we still wanting? And on this campus, where there's so much language about, let's just move on. And you know, why would we possibly disclose those six thousand documents uh, that will obviously even deepen uh, the 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 necessary accountability of senior administration over the years? You know, I, I think we have all a right to be really sick and tired of that absolute refusal, as Amanda says, to do the hard work. Um, the hard work of history, of what really happened on this campus, or has happened nationally and globally, um, and, and really insist on a, on a restructuring of relations of gender, of race, uh, uh, class, and so forth. Uh, but most folks are just, are just happy to signal a little bit. I do think it's very hard to escape music. This is why I really admire, I mean, my, a lot of my work is in, is in Southern Africa, in rural Southern Africa, and what Isaac said about the power of music, music as a protected form of discourse, but you can't get away from the great songs. And regimes have been brought down by the power of music. Colonialism was destroyed by music, and uh, patriarchy is gonna be held to account more and more by music. So I, I admire, you can't escape uh, the, the fundamental, uh, music is, our, is the most foundational of art forms, uh, uh, which forces us to become attuned to other people even when we want to deny that shared humanity. So it's that the work that artists are doing on the front lines is, is so important, though I know it's hard. And I think that's the reason that we're seeing such backlash in, in the music industry directly against women and women's voices, precisely because they're trying to hold those in power to account. Um, other questions and thoughts? Uh, yeah. um, and by the way, do, maybe, do, you mind, do you mind speaking into the mic? Yeah. Is that everybody? Um, so I am Dr. Ray's a music and violence class. I don't think that's on. It's not on. Okay, <laughs> never mind. I can, talk, I can talk for a lot. So. Hello. Okay, so I'm in Dr. Ray's music and violence class. And something that we talk a lot about is how music is something that we naturally, as humans, can't turn off. Because if we don't want to listen to something, the only way that we can shut that off is literally by closing our ears. We don't have a natural mechanism for it. So I think that's why it's so important about this idea of music and healing, because we, we hear it. It's not escapable. It's, it's everywhere, right? Um, and the same as myself being a singer about um, singing in particular, and we talked about this in Dr. Ray's class, also about how um, the voice is so much a part of your identity, because everyone has their own voice, right? And um, when a trauma happens and you feel like your identity's been taken away, sometimes it's really hard to find 
um, your voice a voice again because it's been silenced. So um, through singing and growing through singing again, it's a way to kind of um, grow through that trauma and learn how to find the voice that had been silenced. Other thoughts or, or questions? Could, could one of the students just tell us a little bit about the thinking that went into the, the choices of the selections, which I did think were inspired? Yeah. So for the chamber ensemble, uh, originally we wanted to perform this song called She by Oram Bula. Um, and when I sent the lyrics to Dr. Ray, she pointed out to me that some of them might be like inappropriate for this kind of um, performance, which made me like realize um, how music has so many different meanings, depending on who's listening to it, who's performing it, what context, etc. Um, so I found that like finding my own solo performance too. There were a couple that I was like, oh, this might be great. And then I like thought about it and I was like, I don't want to make like anything, like any mistake in some way that would, that could be misconstru misconstrued in a way I don't want it to be. So I chose songs that like emphasize love and um, like the state of being, like, you know, human is like, I'm only human and I'm just trying to live and survive and then like love is love is love it's all about love and then rainbow also is just like accepting yourself and even if you can't see it you have a rainbow where you had your special you can't change that right it, it did seem I, I don't know if this is it just so happened that, that there was a, so many interesting relations between rainbow which turns out to be a sort of uh, a ministering to the self which certainly happens with Amanda's song too that uh that uh, I the keep comparing me to Casey Musgraves. <laughs> 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 That's true. I mean, there's there's something about when becomes one you know performer become, becomes a, one's own physician, and that's a, and that's a very powerful and political stance, uh, which is which was great. It was a wonderful choice. I think I'm Sorry. So, kind of along those same lines, um, and how words have meaning in songs. Um, was working with a lady in a fusion, and she she identified country music as, as her, her favorite style. So I did a, a John Pine tune. Um, that's as country as it gets. It's like three chords and um, and a three four feel, and um, you know it's a, it's a great song. But the last verse said, "When I die, let my ashes float down the green river. Let my soul roll on up to the." Um, something Rochester Dam and uh, and it's really not about dying or ashes or anything it's just, it's just kind of a, in the last verse and I later on had heard from a, a, a nurse that that had really upset her and it was her first chemo and um, and it just really started you know getting me thinking about lyrics um, well I, I do all the time but um, it really reminded me that words are powerful and Fortunately, I had the good fortune of seeing her again in about two weeks after that and, and apologized and I said that certainly was never my intention to, to upset you and, uh, and, and all was well, but um, you know, words, words are powerful. So. I think the nature of doing serious trauma-informed work is that we are open to make mistakes and the important thing is to, is to stay open and listen and acknowledge those mistakes and then together move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, so my name is Anna Spinal. I'm a journalist with the State News. I had a question for Dr. Ray. Yeah. Um, how do you think music can help us approach sensitive issues such as sexual assault? Yeah, um, so music I found is really, really great. Um, all my classes, like I teach a course on music and identity, which is about race and class and gender and sexuality and disability studies. And I found actually that music is perfect for this because it allows us to have something out there to talk about rather than me versus you, right? And what's beautiful about talking about music and the way that everyone has been talking about is there's so many different perspectives on one song that people are hearing and it's so many different things 
that through the process of talking about what a song means, we realize that it's complicated and that we begin to see that people have different perspectives, even in the same song that we're hearing. Um, and so I found, at least in my own courses, that music offers us an opportunity to see things from different perspectives, and it invites us to have empathy, because it's their experience, right? And you can't argue, well, that's not what it means, right? Because who knows, right? I mean, I talk, I talk to students all the time, like, because a lot of especially classically trained singers are like, well, what did the composer mean? And I'm like, who cares what he meant? Other people have ideas about what it means, and that's just as real as whatever the composer intended. And so I think music really does provide this opportunity to have the kind of difficult conversations we need to have um, without it devolving into kind of uncomfortable situations. Thank you. I'm also struck that uh, this sort of idea of attunement, which obviously musicians are, are familiar with, is very important in the history of philosophy, especially phenomenological philosophy. That the very we, we don't have ESP, but somehow we exist as a human community, which we often we often betray one another. But the foundation of being human is that we become attuned to one another. So music really is a model for that process and for healing journeys ultimately. And there's a each work of art uh, in this exhibition, in different ways, is about uh, the horrors of, of, of gender-based violence and of the isolation uh, and self-doubt and, uh, and cycles of recrimination that are all part of that, but also about a journey that is partially collective, and that's uh, beautifully expressed by uh, Alexander Burke's piece, which you'll see in the second gallery. Um, in which a fractured body, the, the dressmaker's model, is clothed and healed through the voices, through these reborn 300 butterflies of 300 sister survivors that, that come together in the most miraculous way, um, both to dramatize what was lost and then give something back. And, and I felt that with the Women's Chamber Ensemble. I mean, the, the, you know, the, 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 the very powerful and beautiful performance in which all coming together created something that transcended what even what an individual vocalist can do is and that just seemed to make visible precisely this extraordinary power of, 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 of the attunement that is possible through music. It was a it was a beautiful thing. Yeah. And also knowing that this was your home base, uh, Amanda's home base when you were on campus, when this university, you know, was part of betraying you and so many others. And it just seemed what a perfect homecoming to have the women's chamber ensemble. So we've sort of run out of time, the bell reminds us. Um, but please uh, uh, do explore the exhibition. The exhibition is not only up here, there's a game you can see, created uh, uh, by the education team that children play about consent. And then this extraordinary painting upstairs, at the top of the stairs to the left, uh, by Sister Survivor, uh, Jordan Fishman, um, and, and impacted gymnast to tell us a really remarkable story of the triptych. So please explore come up and talk. Thank you so much. Thanks especially to the, the vocalists and the musicians. Uh, what a beautiful night.